Hello, everyone. Welcome to our iOS Developers Test Night event. My name is Alexey Chulochnikov. I am an engineer and manager on the iOS team and based in Ukraine. We are responsible for developing iOS product offerings, such as our keyboard and companion application. I am pleased to moderate today's talk. During iOS Developers Test Night, our three iOS engineers, Slava, Igor, and Roman, will explain how we deploy and deliver apps without in-house QAs at Grammarly. Before we jump in, I would like to cover a few event lo logistics. First of all, information about Q&A session. Please submit your questions to a Q&A session during the presentation, and the speakers will address them right after the, their talks. You can also ask speakers anything during net the networking session. Networking session. After the talk and QA session, we are inviting you to a networking session to chat in a more informal atmosphere with our speakers and the Grammarly team. So you are welcome and encouraged to join. We will share the link uh, to a networking session at the end of our event. And. Let us now get to the central part of our today's meetup. And I'm thrilled to introduce the first speaker, Slava Volodka, iOS software engineer and tech lead. Please welcome Slava Volodka. Hey, hello everybody. I'm super excited to have all of you here at our iOS test night. Uh, I'm Slava and that's a slide where I should tell you some boring things about myself to reassure my credibility, but I obviously don't want to bore you. So let me just tell you three, some fun facts about myself. First one, I spent five years riding a sport bike and as of now I've crashed it on a track. And so I know what happens if product you use crashes, it actually hurts. And second, I love playing music and I have four guitars and I just got fifth one recently. And I'm not some crazy music maniac, but I can tell you exactly which, uh, exactly why I need each of those. So uh, I like to be precise with the tools. And I have a small test device farm and our uh, UI tests we uh, run uh, at, uh, for iOS keyboard are running there. And during the past few years, this farm has moved together with me for five times. So that's how I value proper automated testing. So since you already know a little about me, let's get straight to the business. Today, I'll give an overview of why we chose to keep all of the testing processes in the engineering team's hands. And then we'll talk through the things we've automated so far. And after that, there is a fun part. We'll speak about some shameful, shameful failures we have faced and the lessons we got from them. And I'll keep uh, the intrigue about manual testing till the end of the story. So let's begin with engineering culture. So typically uh, communication between engineers and users is very limited. So in many different companies, there are uh, several tiers of customer support teams who filter users' feedback uh, before it reaches engineers. And engineers also receive some info from product team, but it's uh, got from customer support or marketing research team uh, in turn, and it's also filtered. So it's a reasonable way to communicate, otherwise engineers would be too overwhelmed with that info, but uh, in many uh, product companies, uh, as well as in Grammarly, we do more. So what we want to do is to keep engineer as close to user as possible. Uh, because engineer is a person who knows the abilities of their technical stack in the best way possible. And when you put an engineer close to a user, you get a person who understands user pains the best. And when you have a person who knows people problems and how to solve them simultaneously, you get a person who's most capable of useful innovation. And that's why we have a lot of feedback channels with App Store, customer support, and even Twitter feedback, and it all goes into one place. And we read them daily. 
And uh, keeping an engineer close to the user is a reason why we don't have QAs. We, when uh, you know your user and you care a lot about your user and you know nobody will check what you deliver to your user, that gives you the unique sense of responsibility. And that responsibility helps you come up with the most reasonable testing process. And when uh, engineers are the only ones responsible for testing, they obviously start to automate everything. And anytime we ship some feature, we ship uh, some set of tests to cover it. And anytime we face a bug or an issue, we had a test to prevent from, uh, from seeing that bug in the future. And uh, many bugs are hard to be covered with simple unit to integration tests. So you end up with all kinds of automated testing. And uh, at, uh, for our iOS products, we have unit tests, integration tests, snapshot tests, UI tests, and some fancy stability and performance tests. And uh, this is important because uh, you do not limit your coverage to unit tests and uh, you can provide uh, more optimal coverage with a smaller number of tests when you uh, do not limit yourself to just unit tests. And let's uh, take an example. Uh, for example, almost any application uh, has some networking in place, right? And imagine uh, we have some class which implements a network layer. And it's responsible for performing requests and responses for your server. And when you cover it with unit tests, you need to add some mocks. And uh, uh, that mocks uh, represent uh, like requests and responses. And your unit test covers that your network class works properly in, in sync with that mocks. However, this does not guarantee that your mocks match the actual requests and responses your server implements. And then that's why uh, if you want to get a better coverage, you need to add some integration tests. And uh, when you add integration tests here, uh, you can see that they cover the same things that unit tests do, but they cover it better because they guarantee that your requests and responses your networking class uh, implements, they are not only valid, but they are compatible with your server. And uh, this means that in cases like this, you can omit added, adding unit tests and limit yourself just with integration tests and save some time here. And another interesting example of test automation is stability tests. So imagine your application is covered with a good set of tests and it runs perfectly when you do a manual smoke test, right? But does this guarantee that your application will perform great in the long run? Our experience says that it doesn't. For example, uh, imagine you have a memory leak and during short run, it might be okay. But when you use your application for a long time, the more uh, you use it, the more memory gets leaked until uh, the system kills your application. And of course, we can make a unit test that covers particular memory leak, but we need to know a specific place in the code uh, where you might have at least that leak. So you should either to know that place beforehand, or if you write tests like this, it probably means that you are fixing bugs uh, a bug which has already happened. And stability tests help us deal with uh, this before we ship this problem to production. So in our case, stability test is a UI test and it runs the same scenario uh, many times over and over again. And it ensures that your application process is not killed. For example, we have uh, a couple of stability tests. One is opening uh, our Grammarly keyboard 
and changes current text field of the some test application. And it repeats it for a hundred of times and checks that our process is not killed, and uh, which means uh, the keyboard itself is stable. And this covers our initialization and deinitialization process. And the second test does the same, but it performs a short scenario uh, uh, between uh, switching uh, between the text fields. And here you can see on the video how it looks like. So if you have a memory leak, uh, your application will probably crash at some point. And this scenario does not only cover memory uh, leaks, but uh, some other potential instabilities. And uh, we actually have uh, caught some uh, memory leaks in practice uh, using tests like this. And unlike unit tests, stability tests do not indicate a specific problem you might have. So you will need an additional investigation. However, they help you prevent shipping the unstable version of your product to production. So that's why it's a great test to perform. And when you have a lot of tests, uh, you need to find a good balance between those. Many people ignore UI tests because they are hard to write and it's they're hard to maintain too. And that's true. And uh, that's an excellent reason to avoid building all the test coverage exclusively on these kind of tests. However, UI tests give you automated end-to-end -end regression testing. And that's capable of finding bugs that unit or simple integration tests might miss. And uh, so the best strategy is to have some uh, end to end test suit, but to keep the amount of these tests uh, fairly small. And the cheaper the test is, the more of them you should add. And uh, we don't uh, want to add 100% unit test coverage. We want to uh, have a good coverage of the essential parts of our product. And in general, uh, what I'm uh, currently uh, referring to is Martin Fowler's uh, Practical Test Pyramid. So I highly recommend uh, his original article and basically it's classics. And uh, what I can tell you from uh, our own experience that uh, violating using that test pyramid might cause you some troubles. So with this, let's go to the fun part, the failures and stuff we got from them. So first one is about our UI test, I told you before. Uh, so we have around 100 UI test cases running. And as uh, our main product is keyboard, most of those tests are about the keyboard performance. And as iOS keyboard is adaptive, and their layout and features are different on different devices. So we need to test different device types to get a proper coverage. And also iOS keyboard API behaves differently in different iOS applications. And that means we need to test keyboard behavior on top of different iOS applications. And uh, this forces us to use a real device farm instead of simulators, because you cannot uh, install third party application into the simulator. And that causes us some trouble in maintaining this setup and test stability itself is uh, also not very good. And this also leads us to an enormous amount of test runs because the combinatorics is playing against us here. And this takes the overall uh, coverage uh, quite long. So at certain point, we realized that only tiny part of our functionality actually depends on third party applications. So currently we are creating a test, uh, a set of integration tests that only checks the uh, nuances of our integration with third party applications. And we have automated uh, top 20 most popular applications our users uh use like and 
uh, that allowed us to separate and move other test cases to iOS simulators. And uh, this gives us a better coverage, a more stable setup, and the ability to run those tests in the cloud. And uh, there will be a good piece on UI tests in a talk uh, uh, my colleague uh, Igor will give up just after mine. So stay in touch for more details on UI tests. And another uh, uh, interesting failure story is how we forced a massive group of our users to sign up. So Grammarly allows using its product offering, offerings in anonymous mode. But we encourage people to sign in because this way people can enjoy more features and get more personalized experience. And of course, anonymous users are still, uh, they still need credentials uh, to use our services under the hood. And we obtain and store those technical credentials inside our client applications. And we obviously store uh, user's credential in iOS Keychain in quite a complex form. And once upon a time, we added some changes to the data format, and we missed the fact that these changes became to be incompatible with previously stored data. And what made the matter worse, since we could not parse these credentials, we uh, treated user as an anonymous, and we got anonymous credentials and overwritten the actual user's credentials with anonymous ones. And that means that we could not recover that uh, credential data. And that was a massive inconvenience to our users because they had to sign in back again and people do hate to sign in. And, uh, there are uh, several lessons we got from this problem. First one is uh, to design systems in way that data loss is not likely. Like, and in case uh, you can have a data loss, try adding some migration tests and uh, cover your, uh, the weak points of your system design with migration tests. And each time uh, you begin a release process, you should do some smoke testing and check that uh, your application, when you upgrade uh, your release candidate from a previous version, uh, you do not see some random sign out or any data loss. And next story is about measurement. So our main product is a keyboard. And uh, people obviously uh, hate it when keyboard crashes. And Apple engineers know that very well. So iOS can even remove your keyboard from the active keyboard list when your keyboard crashes too often. So that makes crashes like very, very critical thing for us. And what Apple engineers didn't uh, expect is how much we would care about the crash rate and how much uh, we'll invest into the crash rate uh, reduction. So we uh, would want to see uh, the keyboard uh, crash rate. And back in the day, App Store Connect dashboards could only show you combined total crashes for both your container application and all of its bundled uh, application extensions. And when your product grows fast, your crashes also grow fast, even if your crash rate is constant because more uh, users you have, more sessions you have, more crashes you have. So that's why we want, um, wanted to create our own crash handle. And that crash handle uh, was saving some crash info. And then we would report it anonymously on the next launch. So uh, that was a reasonable thing and we liked it and we shipped it. And we were super happy because first day after the launch, uh, we did not only get a crash metric, but it was showing very low results. And the system crash metric also went down like significantly. And after that, we started to get a strange reports from our product manager and some other weird reports from our users. 
about a weird state uh, where our keyboard becomes unresponsive and you cannot close it unless you reboot your iPhone. And that was some bizarre thing because usually you have a crash and that's it. And we started to um, hear some uh, about this issue from our support team as well. So product was that uh, the problem was that in certain conditions our crash handle was hanging and system could not kill our process because it was already in the crashed state and process was just stuck. And we missed that and we shipped that and we lost a lot of time because uh, after release because we thought that we were heroes who improved the crash rate while in practice we did the opposite. So there are two uh, sad lessons we got from here. First is uh, when your numbers look too good to be true, you should investigate anyway, because that might be a sign of you are doing something wrong in production anyway. And second one, if you have to ship some dangerous changes, don't uh, do it quickly. Let it live internally for a while and uh, software problems are not always some crashes or bugs. Sometimes it's pretty interesting stuff with much, much harder explanations. So with that, let's go to the intrigue. Do we have uh, manual testing in Gremlin? Yes, we do. And uh, in iOS, we have it in two places. So first one is a release checklist. What's a release checklist? It's obvious. It's a list of things we do before each release. And we have two reasons to have it. First one is consistency. We want to have the release process the same, regardless of who is a release engineer today. And the second is to save experience. So each time we have a problematic release, like one I've described to you before, we sit together and we do a post-incident review. And we think about what uh, could we do to prevent the issue? And very often the answers come up as the steps which end up in the release checklist. So basically the release checklist is partly built as a product of our failures. And it helps us to ensure we never repeat our mistakes again in the future. And the release checklist has a lot of steps and many of those are checking automation test reports and checking performance metrics and stuff like that. However, we perform smoke tests as well. It helps to be more sure about our releases and to find bugs in places which were not covered by our test suite by any of reasons. And in practice, we still uh, find some bugs time to time during the smoke test. So, uh, and typically it uh, does not take uh, a long time to perform. An experienced engineer runs smoke test on all the device varieties within less than a day, typically it takes several hours. And this makes uh, us keeping the smoke test in the loop uh, because we still find bugs and it does not take uh, too much time for us. And another great place where we have a manual testing is code review. Uh, it might be a bit unexpected, but we have a beautiful CI script that builds, builds our application from each pull request branch. And code review user can quickly and easily install uh, the build from your pull request and test it without checking out the branch. And this way, code reviewer can find some corner cases and proves that your code does not perform there very well and or just uh, do some random research and uh, see how it looks like or they might be just curious of how that functionality actually works. So uh, time to time uh, code reviewers find bugs and they these bugs are filtered out during the code review before the, go the code gets merged and before we uh, perform 
like any heavy testing we do after the merge and pull request. So let's jump to conclusions. So uh, first one is I highly recommend everybody to try out working without QA. You have, uh, even if you do have uh, QA engineers in your team, I recommend to try it as an exercise because it will force you to dive deep into your product delivery process and it will force you to make it great. And uh, you'll find a lot of places where you can make your testing process perfect. So it's uh, at least a great exercise to do that then. And with or without QAs, you will always have some troubles on production because we're only humans. And each time you do, get as much knowledge as, as possible from that failure and make sure this knowledge will be shared with all your teams and will live for years so that it will never be forgotten. And never hesitate to try a new kind of automation testing. Some of those might be a wasted time, but other will turn out to be extremely useful and you will never know which will be useful and which will be wasted. So you need to try all of those. And uh, always remember about uh, test pyramid and have large amount of cheap tests and small amount of expensive tests. And I guess, uh, that's it for me. Thank you. And let's switch to the Q&A session. Thank you, Slava. Uh, I see several questions, so let's answer them. Uh, first question was, what tech stack do you use in integration testing? How it works in your case? Okay, so uh, we use the same uh, ICSI test and our integration test look exactly as a typical native iOS unit tests. It's just a separate uh, target or currently I guess it's separate a uh, test plan with tests that are actually communicating with our server. Thank you, Slava. Uh... One more question. Can you share your useful automatic testing tools for testing UI? Mm. Uh, I guess we only use ICSI test and all it provides. And we do not use uh, third party tools. Uh, we use a lot of uh, useful things for uh, setting up the CI uh, for UI test because it's uh, I guess it's uh, uh, so complex that uh, we could make another tech talk about it. Okay, thank you. And one more question. Uh, can you please tell me more about your own crash handler? How much time have you spent to support it? Worth it to have your own crash handler or it's easier to use third party? Well, uh, I think we've uh, spent not more than a week to implement one and it lived with us uh, for one release only. And uh, after that, we uh, abandoned the idea because uh, uh, weird behavior in application extension targets but recently we've discovered that third party tools like Sentry and Firebase Crashlytics uh, has good support of uh, third party, uh, of, sorry, uh, for application extensions. So we uh, currently use a third party one. Thank you, Slava. We have more questions, but we would like to be on time with our event so you can save your question to our networking session and we may discuss them later on. So now I propose to move further. Thank you, Slava. And now I would like to pass the floor to our second speaker, Igor Savinsky, our iOS software engineer. 
Joe, my name is Eve Reichhardt and I'm working at Grammarly Iris team, uh, which is which mainly focuses on Grammarly keyboard and text editor, our own text editor. I started doing iOS development since iOS 8, and by coincidence, it was the first version where Apple introduced keyboard extension and the whole ability for us to have third party keyboards and to use them on our devices. Today, I will talk to you about how do we test software keyboard at, uh, at Grammarly. So it uh, will be uh, split into three main parts. So we'll consider what's actually the difference when we are testing regular iOS applications and uh, keyboard, uh, keyboard extensions. Then we will also take a look at uh, keyboard UI tests and keyboard snapshot, uh, keyboard snapshot tests. So what is keyboard extension under, under the food? This illustration tries to answer what keyboard extension uh, under the hood and how that looks like. What is the key player there? So first of all, keyboard extension is expansion and it can't live by its own. So it needs to be shipped with the containing application, which is shown in the center. Containing application, it as a rule has some onboarding and uh, also has some settings, which allow to customize appearance and behavior of our extension. Extension itself is shown, uh, it's shown on the left. And uh, the interesting part starts in the next because any application on your device which has text field may want to present your keyboard. And that application becomes, uh, becomes host for your keyboard and shown on the right. So literally Instagram, Twitter, WhatsApp, they also play in our uh, players in our uh, pipeline, which we need to develop keyboard. So to reiterate, we have three players, containing application, keyboard itself, and the host application. Now with that knowledge, we can uh, look how that affects UI testing or the whole thing. And uh, yeah, at first, uh, let's, uh, uh, let's consider steps we all got used to. So when we are doing, when we are testing our regular iOS application. So it, we can break it into three main steps. The first one is we need to launch our application um, possibly specifying some parameters in order to be in specific authentication state or switch on and off some features. Then we need to simulate user interaction with the application UI. And on a final third step, we need to assert that um, our application is in a correct state. And uh, when it comes to testing the keyboard, we need more steps to go through. So additional steps are highlighted with the green color here. So the first steps remains almost the same. We need to launch container application where and pass probably some parameters in order to be in, in specific authentication state and uh, switch on and off some features. The second step is a new one because uh, in order to appear, our keyboard should be explicitly added by user to the list of keyboards in a settings application on your iPhone. And uh, then on third step, we can launch host application. In this particular case, it is the messages application uh, from Apple. And uh, even after this step, we actually not ready to start testing our keyboard because we need to select our keyboard in the list of uh, keyboards installed and used and selected by the user on this device. And only after this step, on the, as a step five, we actually can start simulate some user interaction with our keyboard. So probably typing some text, applying some suggestions, corrections. And so on the final step, again, it, it is the same. We need to assert that both host application has a correct state, probably that the text is correct, and that our keyboard also has a correct state, probably it's showing the correct type of keyboard, 
and correct uh, and it shows correct cards there. Now that we have an idea how that step, which steps we need to take during the UI test, um, let's dive deeper into into that. So as Slava already mentioned, we run our tests both over simulator and device. So we tend to run most of our UI tests over simulator because they are pretty uh, fast to set up and uh, cheap to actually maintain comparing to the farm with a real device. But uh, still we need to run our UI tests over real devices. And uh, the reason is that we need to ensure that our keyboard works correctly in a third party real life application like um, like messages instagram twitter and uh, yeah as you know the third party application real life applications they cannot be installed on a simulator so that's why we need to run our tests over real devices and also one uh, one more thing is that uh, it's pretty often real life applications they actually uh, adding some fancy enhance enhancements to text fields in order to achieve some specific behaviors. And again, we need to ensure that our keyboard operates uh, as expected there. And uh, yeah, that's why we need to run it there. And uh, actually, we support all of that um, host applications. It's uh, um, shown on this slide. So uh, we have uh, special data types representing each type of host application. So uh, they, are sh they are shown on the right. And uh, as a rule, they contain bundle identifier, which is needed for us in order to be able to launch that host application uh, from within UI test. Also, they have a set of element locators which are specific to that application, which are needed for us to be able to navigate within that application to desired text field. And also they are handling, um, they are handling any differences if that application looks and behaves differently on different devices like iPhone, iPad, or in different device orientations. Uh, but uh, taking, Text fields, it's not it's not enough for testing text fields because text fields could result in so many possible could have could be in so many possible states because it's a combination of a lot of configurations. So there could be different types of text fields like UI text field, UI text view, UK web view. The text field may specify different content types. So they may expect to input phone numbers, URLs, regular tracks, and they also may specify different requirements to the keyboard, like keyboard appearance, dark or light, or keyboard return keys. And we need to ensure that uh, we, are, we are operating and we are, our keyboard looks as expected there. And obviously we can't do that with a dozen of uh, third party applications we can test that edge cases. And uh, in order to do that, we have a special auxiliary application which allow us uh, to test almost any type of uh, text field. We are like decorating it by ourselves. So as it's shown here, we can select uh, UI text, whether we want to test UI text field, UI text view, VKB view, other text inputs, then we can configure them with different content types and different requirements to the keyboard. So, and um, what our tests about, uh, they obviously as we are testing keyboards, they are almost uh, all about typing the text. This is why uh, we, are, uh, we need to, to consider how do we type the text. So we all got used to standard type text method, which lives in XC test, but uh, it doesn't work for custom keyboards because this text can input text using system keyboard. And it actually doesn't know how to input text with your custom keyboard 
what to press there, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's why we need to build our our own API to be able to type text with our keyboard and test. So the, the easiest one approach it is by querying elements. So the keyboard itself, it is a set of buttons uh, and each button represents some character. So we can tap it and we are done. So schematically it is uh, shown in the code block. Imagine we need to type, for example, hello world. Then what we do, we iterate over each character. We query corresponding button for that query, uh, for that character. Uh, take and first match, wait for it to exist, and tap. But it's, it doesn't work for us because each of the steps, as you can see, it uh, requires some awaiting. And uh, it, it results in a really, really, really slow typing. So, which is shown, yeah, uh, literally it's uh, almost, almost shows the real typing speed with this approach. And uh, of course, it doesn't work for us because when you have hundreds of tests, all of them about typing text, you need to, you don't have uh, time to waste your resources with such kind of typing. That's why we need to, we had to come up with some another approach and it was typing by coordinates. Uh, so the idea is shown in code block about, about me. So imagine again, we need to type some text. Then we again iterate over each character but instead of querying buttons from a keyboard and doing all of the jazz with waiting and tapping, we literally get coordinate of that, of that key on the device screen and send tap to that coordinate. That's it, we are done. And so worth mentioning how actually we get, uh, how we get coordinates of the key. So uh, we have a mapping between different devices and their orientation and expected coordinate of a keyboard keys on that device, which is also shown on iPhone and iPad on the slide, uh, yeah, uh, this idea. And uh, let's see the difference between these two ways uh, of uh, typing, what we have achieved with that. So um, for example, as a, simple, as a sample input, let's strike on a tweet, which is one of the most popular tweets this year by Elon Musk. So. Um, by the way, it also, uh, it's not like plain typing of the text. It also requires multiple switching between keyboards because it has upper cases, lower cases, and it has special characters. So uh, if you compare where uh, typing, this is a slow, slow approach by querying buttons and with the typing with the coordinates, we can see that the typing by coordinates is 17 times faster, which is a huge uh, time saver time saver for us. Okay, moving on to snapshot tests. Um, iOS keyboard is pretty unique product because it uh, it needs to operate in uh, in, in a pretty limited uh, space, and we need to fit there all of the keyboard keys. We need to feed there our top panel where we actually show all the completions, suggestions, cards, and all the functionality which makes your custom keyboard so special. That is why the value of each pixel is uh, higher compared with the regular iOS application. And uh, also, as we have uh, invested a lot of time into polishing UI and crafting fancy animations. We also wanted to protect that our investment from degrading over the time. And snapshot tests, they are coming to the rescue in this uh, case because yeah, they allow us to validate our expected and actual UI literally pixel by pixel. And this is exactly what, uh, what we need. On, on on this slide, I've like gathered some examples what we put under snapshot test. So it's uh, starting from the snapshot in the whole keyboard on different devices with different appearances, keyboard of different types like character numbers to also snapshot in views uh, with the emojis 
some short term top panels with our suggestions, with, with buttons, whatever we can. Uh, if whatever has UI, we can snapshot and we actually can put it under snapshot test. They are, they are, they are pretty easy to set up because uh, all we need is to create a view, fill it with the data, and take a snapshot. It is super fast comparing to UI tests where we actually need to launch host application. Then we need to interact with it, navigate to some specific view, and only then we can see it on UI. So they are super fast. Snapshot tests, they are super fast. And uh, also it's super convenient to catch the issues. So imagine that um, after, after some recent year code changes, some snapshot test fails, and um, you can go to the, to the test uh, report. You can find the failing test, and uh, it has some attached files helping to understand what actually went there. So, the first uh, attached file called reference it is actually actually expected UI. So, in we can see that in this case, it expects a pop up with a set of uh, some up emojis. Then also it attaches uh, attaches the screenshot with the failure where you can see that uh, actually uh, after its execution it still pop up with some emojis and even even if at this point the issue is not clear test kindly attaches the third attachment which highlights the difference and highlights the pixels which didn't match between. Uh, expected in the actual snapshot. So in this particular case, we can see the issue with uh, some bop emoji, and actually we got okay emoji in the middle of uh, of the of the pop up. So and uh, it's nice that snapshot testing helps you to catch the issues after code changes, but it also helps a lot when it uh, comes to review some changes in UI code. Please be prepared. I hope that next slide won't hurt you too much. So imagine that uh, you need to review some some changes in UI, and uh, needless to say that it's really hard to read the changes happening in a zip file, and it is impossible to virtually compile and imagine how the UI looks before and how it looks now. So and compare that to reviewing code changes when you have snapshots. So it uh, allows you to compare snapshots and UI before and after literally side by side. So in this particular example, we can see that Grammarly button got uh, additional notification badge, uh, badge and uh, yeah, that is, that is a different here. So again, reiterating snapshot tests, they are real, real lifesaver. They are uh, pretty fast to write and easy to set up. And also the icing on the cake, we found effortless way to add snapshot tests that will be covered by Roman in the next talk. I encourage you to visit. This slide marks the end of my presentation. So it shows how Dell E AI model imagines IO software keyboard testing. I hope that uh, I managed to share a better picture how software keyboard testing looks uh, at Grammarly. Uh, thank you for joining and excited to answer questions, if any. Igor, thanks a lot for sharing this with us. There is a question from an audience. Uh, did you measure how turbo typing improved CI CD pipeline speed? Yeah, uh, we didn't measure it uh, how, how much it improved CI CD pipeline speed because it was obvious that slow typing doesn't won't work for us. It was obvious from the beginning that is why we had to find another way. But what we have measured is uh, the improvement when uh, for, for one particular test case, like I showed, uh, turbo typing is approximately seventeen times faster. Okay, Igor. We also have one more question. How exactly did you get the location of keys on a keyboard? 
Yeah, I will. Uh, uh, so let me. Yep. Uh, so uh, we store this location of the center of each key in uh, files. Uh, it's literally JSON files. And uh, whenever we need to get coordinate, we go to the corresponding JSON file and query coordinate for this keyboard on a screen. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot for your answers. And now let's move to our next speaker, Roman Tisechnik, our iOS engineer. Hello, hello everyone. It's so great to see you here. Let me just share my screen. Okay, uh, well, so first of all, thanks for joining and I'll start with uh, auto-generated snapshot tests over SwiftUI previews. And just give me one more second. Okay, let's start. So before we start exactly about our topic, I'll just tell you a little bit more about myself. Uh, my name is Roman Tisichnik. I work as IS engineer for more than five years. And I also want to share some facts about me. Uh, my first ever task as a software engineer was to actually set up snapshot tests. And my first ever topic that I've ever presented as a speaker was also about snapshot tests. It was like years ago, and I used to think that snapshot tests have no more place to evolve, but I'm super glad that I was wrong, and I'll tell you what we've came up to in Grammarly. Okay, so first of all, small warm up, please share plus or minus in chat if you have snapshot tests on your current project. It would be really, really interesting to know. All right, all right. So I see something like an average plus minuses. I'd say more minuses, probably. Okay. And all right. Interesting to know. Um, I'll try to do my best to uh, suggest you uh, using snapshot tests and we'll actually, I'll be thankful for your feedback if you are interested about that and you may consider using that approach that we will share with you today. Uh, so let's jump to the agenda. Uh, we'll have a quick overview of snapshot tests that we have in our keyboard, uh, especially for those who have never worked with snapshot tests before. Uh, then we'll talk about the development flow that you may be familiar with if you use both snapshot tests and SwiftUI previews uh, presented in iOS 13. Uh, then you'll find out how to create test cases based on these SwiftUI previews, just to stop writing, uh, and I call these tests two times. And finally, you found that, find out how to generate this test automatically. Okay, so let's jump to a quick uh, look uh, at snapshot tests. So what are snapshot tests? Snapshot tests compare your UI using two images generated from your views. The purpose of this test is just to have a visualization of uh, your view with some state being in the specified environment. Uh, basically, it allows you to run this test uh, later on CI or, for example, during refactoring to ensure that nothing has changed. Or if it has changed, these changes are exactly what, uh, what you uh, expect. Uh, what is required to integrate snapshot tests in your IIS or microIS project? Well, first of all, uh, you have to choose a tool for snapshotting because uh, Xcode, like it's been se several years since the idea appeared, and Xcode still doesn't support uh, snapshot tests out of the box. Uh, I'd suggest you uh, pick one of the two most popular frameworks. So one is by Uber and second is by, by point three. Second, you have to set up a unit test bundle where you will have your test cases. Since these are snapshot tests are just regular unit tests, you may not need to create a separate target for them, but you'd still want to have a separate scheme or a test plan to run them separately from your usual unit tests. And the last one is I'd suggest you configure in Git LFS to store your images in a separate file storage to have much faster interactions with Git. Okay, so what are the benefits of snapshot tests that we have in our project? Uh, usually people consider that um, snapshot tests are only required for the main app to compare how your UI looks like between different devices, like for example, iPhone versus iPad or iPhone 12 Pro versus iPhone SE, and of course, comparing light and dark mode. But in fact, we can compare much more than this. Uh, first of all, we can make sure that our UI is stable between major iOS versions, like in iOS 16, which was released recently, where Apple has changed uh, UI stack view behavior just a little bit, but eventually it has caused some unexpected layout changes that we were lucky to catch uh, because we had snapshot tests. 
Uh, we can also compare how it, how our UI looks with different accessibility settings. For example, uh, when we have both uh, um, and large fonts enabled on the device, or when user has a different content size, or for example, when we have a reduced transparency. Uh, we should also remember about uh, pretty rare cases like split view and floating mode on iPad, where incorrectly configured UI may completely mess up users, uh, user's impression on your app. And if you have an app clip, you may uh, pr probably reuse your UI from the main application, uh, uh, like making your app clip, which without, with, you know, with some small tiny changes they, that you may forget and don't test, uh, which is why I would also recommend you create separate snapshot test cases for the case when you uh, build your app as an app clip. And the last one, uh, we can also cover snapshot test uh, UI components for app extensions, not only for keyboard, but we can also do it for, for example, for widgets, for UI in share or action extensions, et cetera. And if you have some rare cases uh, where you use snapshot cases, which are not listed in this list, please share in the comment below. We'd be really, really great uh, to know about them. Okay, so what snapshots do we have in our keyboard? Uh, as I said, usually people just suggest that our keyboard is just a set of you know, keys located on a few rows that uh, there are like maybe a few states when upper and lower key and of course differences between like and dark mode and like that's it but reality is that we have like a thousands of possible states only for an english keyboard they can appear in multiple states having different keyboard types return keys states states for example like force touch you can see it on the left uh, bottom corner uh, separate state for dictation and it can also be customized by the user himself for example if you select a different layout like uh, QWERTY against uh, other T or adding some extra keys, or it can be optimized for the user according, for, according to his region. For example, we can show a proper currency sign for US or GB user, uh, or we can select a, fl a floating point sign because some users uh, have a comma, some have half period, and we had it in cases where it blocked user from typing completely because of, of uh, their region. Yeah, and even more combinations can be achieved on the iPad. Because iPad keyboard significantly increases the complexity of our keyboard because there are about five types that have completely different system keyboard setups. Uh, and since we want to provide our users with an experience that won't be worse than what the system keyboard provides, we have to you know, support all of these types. And uh, you can just compare our keyboard, this is actually our keyboard, uh, on three different iPads, which is iPad 9 generation, iPad Pro 11 inch, and iPad Pro 12.9 inch. You can see that they have completely different key setup. Uh, some of them have additional row with numbers and doesn't have flick keys. And that's actually only uh, only one English keyboard in one layout without any extra changes. But <clears throat> that keyboard is also can be configurable by the user or adopted to some layout. And uh, you can see how our keyboard looks in other T layout compared to the QWERTY on iPad 12.9 inch. And what's important here is that it has completely different shift and enter keys. And we can't ignore that behavior uh, because I'm sure some of you have tried typing on a completely different keyboard, which has a you know shorter or otherwise longer shift and smaller enter, uh, and uh, you just had to get used to it, and it, it will like, really mess up your experience. And you'd suggest just to getting rid of that keyboard and going back to what you got used to. Yeah, and that was on the keyboard view, like a single view which we have uh, in our keyboard extension. Now we have much more views, emojis, different cards, top panels. And that's on the keyboard. Well, we have also a companion app with our uh, login flow, premium flow, and many, many others. All right, so now let's jump to the developer flow where we have snapshot test as a part of our testing step. And we kind of, you know, imagine that we also use Swift UI previews for development. So we can imagine that flow in these four steps. Uh, uh, like, for example, if we start developing some UI. Uh, as a part of our task, we just start defining our uh, view and some view model for it uh, using some plain data, like different types, etc. Uh, then we start uh, debugging it and polishing the UI, adding Swift UI previews. So it will allow us to, you know, without a launching of the main app, just quickly uh, check that our UI looks perfectly in all states. Then we start writing snapshot tests because we want to have that behavior locked with some visual representation in our Git, which is why we have to also cover it with snapshot test doing kind of the same job because we also cover it in most critical and like vital states. 
And then whenever we finished, we're just ready to push uh, our UI on, uh, on the remote repository and, and, and so on. And you can mention that these two steps that I've uh, just mentioned look pretty similar because both in designing Swift UI previews and snapshot test cases, we kind of use a similar approach because in both cases, we have to define uh, the most vital states, the most uh, important sizes, different traits that uh, help us both debugging pro in debugging process and in testing process, which means that we kind of do the double job. So, uh, and our plan was like, why don't we uh, simply get rid of uh, this uh, of this step and just try to use these Swift UI previews to generate our snapshot test cases. And so we came up to the first step, which is like a test cases based on Swift UI previews. And before we continue with some real code examples, I just want to highlight a few dependencies that we use for this implementation so that you could uh, be uh, aware of what's going on and you may find them pretty useful. Uh, first one is snapshotting tools that we chose. Uh, we are using Swift snapshot testing by point three. First of all, because it has pretty comfortable interface and uh, a wide uh, amount of functionality, but the most important is that it doesn't have any um, uh, requirement to use inheritance, because if we use a tool by Uber, we have to inherit from their main class and only then uh, use the functionality. In this framework, it's all defined as global functions, which is completely useful for us to do what we have to do. And another framework that we use is a view inspector that you may have heard before also. Uh, it allows traversing a view hierarchy at runtime. And it, we are using it, for example, to find uh, some view, some specific Swift UI view in the hierarchy of these views. And another one, uh, just in case if you still don't use Swift UI previews for your UI kit views, uh, you can check our engineering blog and find out more about some challenges that we faced. Uh, to integrate those Swift UI previews in our UI kit code. And in, in our uh, upcoming, upcoming code examples, I will also use um, a type called UI kit preview, basically just a handy type that allows us to render UI kit and to return it as a UI view representable and render it as, uh, as a view in, in Swift UI environment. Okay, so now let's start with making some, some new view in our app. So we're just trying to build a key versus view using UI kit view. Uh, we create some view model for it as usually, uh, design, design some labels, uh, any other sub views, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, after we designed our view, we decided, okay, now we have to create a switch UI preview and to start debugging it to save some time, which is why we create some uh, switch UI previews. And you can see we create uh, a group of UI kit previews, which has some specific size. So we want to have that view rendered in a specific uh, width and height. Uh, we set up it, each of them with specific uh, view model for each status that we are interested in. And uh, we could also hear, have here some things like dark mode, additional traits, etc., etc. After that step, we jump to our snapshot tests and create a new test test case class where we do the same. So we like kind of defining all these cases once again. We create a view, create the exact view model, uh, fill it, but also call additional methods that just assorts our, our snapshot of, of this view. Uh, even though it could be simplified, you know, by iterating over all cases of uh, keyboard status view model, if it could be like an enum or, or something else, you still have to do it manually every time, twice, once in the previews and once in snapshot test cases. So what we came up to, uh, it's really simple. Uh, we just removed uh, uh, an extra step by turning uh, this into this. So basically, you can see that we got rid of the group uh, view. And it is now all, the, all our previews are wrapped in a snapshot test case view. Uh, let's find out what's this snapshot test case view. Uh, basically, it's just a container that does nothing except only wraps each of our previews inside. And it could also be customized with extra parameters, uh, for example, the name or some additional settings that you may want to uh, later use in your uh, snapshot test configuration. So what do we have now? Now we can actually extract all test cases from CSUI previews. So remember I've mentioned view inspector uh, framework. What it allows us, it allows us to call method inspect for the previous method, which is, which is just a Swift UI view. And it allows us to call method find all 
where we can pass a type of all views that we want to find. And as a result, we receive an array of all snapshot test case views inside of this uh, hierarchy of SwiftUI previews. And as a result, we receive an actual view of, uh, of that snapshot test case, which is going to be our uh, UIKit preview. And then we run our snapshot uh, uh, tests as an image matching that view. Uh, sounds pretty simple. And how it is just you know, want to mention uh, one uh, extra thing that um, this is just a concept of what you actually have to explain the basics. So you can build whatever you want with this knowledge. For example, you can make some generic base class that you will, uh, where you will describe all that logic. And then you will have to, you know, create only like a subclass of this uh, of this class, just specifying some provider as a generic, or you can choose any other option. However, uh, despite that we've simplified it so much, uh, we have to still do it manually. Like, okay, we don't have to duplicate the logic, how we inspect and find for the view, but we still have to, every time when we write a new view, uh, jump to our test bundle, uh, create a new test class, and to provide it with some previews. Uh, so yes, the flow is a bit simplified, but actually, how how can we get rid of it completely? And why do we can get it? Can we actually do it? Of course we can, because we already described our test. We already provided them with uh, with models, with uh, sizes, with traits. Uh, why don't we just try to generate those tests somewhere in a runtime or a compile time and receive uh, and just use them without even writing? And this is where we jump to the test auto generation uh, step. Uh, before we jump to these uh, options that we considered to use for auto generation, let's see on what we could have without auto generation at all. So let's say we will just start using that approach that I showed you before, and we will have to manually uh, create this, those classes for each new view that we create in our app. So it sounds pretty fast because you wrote that class once and you don't do anything else. Uh, you use sweet language, you don't have any templates because you don't use any generation, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Sounds pretty good, but you have other ministers about that. First of all, you have an option to kind of forget to add the view in the list. Basically, for all the articles, that's not a new, a new thing that you either forget something or you just miss it after rebases, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And talking about rebases, you don't miss git conflicts at all, because if you have some single place uh, where you store all, all those views, uh, you may always face some issues with um, uh, with with conflicts because if you all all your all developers add uh, a new view in a list, you may at some point get a conflict. And of course, uh, your file gets bigger, same as your compile time. And uh, th that approach we just didn't even try to implement and start to think how can we automate that that process. And first thing that comes came on our mind and I'm sure on your mind as well is a sorcery which is like an option to generate all those tests uh, in compile time looking for all uh, CTY preview providers in our app uh, because it's just a protocol and to generate tests for it. Uh, I have some summary about that what I'm thinking about it because first of all you don't use Swift and you use Stencil because you have to know how to uh, write a template and to maintain it. The integration time is pretty slow because you also have to configure that step for all of your targets. For example, if you don't have just an app, but you have a modularized app and you have a lot of targets, you have to configure that generation for all, all targets. And if you add new one, you have also to maintain that. And if for some reason you decide to uh, store those generated files in your Git, you also won't get rid of conflicts. And the last one is uh, the fact that Sorcerer is a third party dependency. You may always expect it to stop working uh, it's much more more reliable uh, these days, but like maybe a few years ago, uh, we faced a lot of uh, issues when we migrated on a new Xcode version. So what we came up to, we came up to just generating those test cases in runtime. Uh, by generating them in runtime, I mean that we just uh, uh, run our tests, and before we started our test uh, execution in runtime, we started searching for all snapshot test case providers that we have in our uh, in, in our runtime, basically, all, for all those classes. Uh, whenever we find them, we just generate a test for it, adding it to our base class, which I will show a bit later, and then the test will be executed. Sounds pretty uh, easy because we have to use Swift uh, language and all knowledge that we have simply to add a dynamic uh, base class. 
the integration time is pretty medium because you may uh, be new in that thing uh, related to Objective-C methods, uh, but whenever you do it, it won't be a problem anymore. You don't have any templates, you don't have any third party dependencies, and you don't have to configure it for each of your targets. And what's cool, you don't generate code at all, which means you are completely safe of any uh, gate conflicts. All right, so let's jump to exact steps how we can do that. Um, first of all, uh, we have to create a dynamic test class inherited from a C-test case. Uh, this class overrides a default test suite property. What is it property about? It is called uh, by the test target to receive all test method methods in this class. So right before uh, uh, our class returns that property, we have actually to add some methods to our class dynamically in runtime, so that the system, so that the test bundle could actually use our dynamically added tests uh, for testing. Uh, and since we don't want to write all these tests uh, manually, mm, we, we just execute them only once by uh, allowing our uh, other classes inherit and override populate dynamic test method, which we'll do a bit later. And in step two, we create a base snapshot test case class inherited from dynamic test case. Uh, and all that this class is capable of is, is basically to verify snapshot test case. So it receives some provider uh, for, for snapshot test case. It retrieves the snapshot test case view and then just runs a snapshot test for it. Uh, also, as you can see, it is, uh, this is the exact place where we will populate dynamic tests, where we will start adding them to our test class which I will show you in a moment. Uh, just to clarify what is a snapshot test case provider in this example, um, basically this is just a SwiftUI preview provider uh, inherited protocol that we use to prevent some SwiftUI previews from generating snapshots. For example, if we have some small view, which we also have SwiftUI preview provider, but we don't want to run snapshots, we can just uh, not do it because we use our custom protocol to find what kind of type uh, we we want to run tests test for. Uh, we, you can use any other approach for that, but we, we chose uh, this one. So how do we find actually all those classes uh, of snapshot test case provider protocol that exist in our system? Uh, for that, we can use an Objective-C method called copy class list. Uh, it allows us to, uh, in a runtime, retrieve all possible classes that are known in runtime. And out of these classes, we can then easily start iterating and looking for our snapshot test case provider class. And whenever we find it, we can simply start uh, adding our dynamic test tests to, to our class. So basically, we run a method called add dynamic test, which is our internal implementation, which receives a provider and receives a block. And the block, in fact, is just a, actually the execution of the test. So like an implementation of that method that we are adding. And after we run our dynamic test inside, all we do is just call, create an implementation with a block that we actually passed with verify snapshot test case. And then we add a, a method to our class uh, uh, with a specified selector. And we also have to include the test uh, prefix in the beginning. So that method will be treated as a test. And in the end, we have to create a snapshot test class which can be just an empty class if you have a single application and no frameworks. And if you have a modularized app or you have just a lot of frameworks with UI, you have also to pass a bundle of, uh, of the exact um, uh, class that you want to test, of the exact bundle, sorry, that you want to test. Otherwise, it may start generating you tests uh, from the entire, uh, from your entire project, which may not uh, work for you. Yeah, and as a result, that's what we got. We got all our snapshot test class. We got all our test cases generated in runtime, and all the previous, uh, all the images for these previews were rendered and stored in our Git. Yeah. So getting back to our flow, uh, as you can see, we just completely removed all the testing step because right after we develop our Suite UI previews and mark them as snapshot test case, uh, that test case will automatically be run uh, for them whenever we run uh, a test. So all we have to do is just trigger our test and our snapshots will be generated. Of course, we don't exclude tests for business logic, integration tests, UI tests, etc. But at least we managed to get rid of one tiny step uh, to write and support snapshot tests. Okay, so now let's jump to the summary. Uh, first of all, I'd suggest using snapshot tests to validate your UI 
not only after your uh, code changes or refactorings, but as well when you, your environment may change. Uh, I'd suggest using Swift UI previews to quickly develop both UI kit and app kit views. Uh, as you have seen, Swift UI previews are absolutely perfect test case candidates for your snapshot tests, and you can use runtime test generation to reduce the amount of code in your merge request. Yeah, so thanks so much for joining. And uh, before we start our uh, uh, before we start, uh, before we start thinking and writing your questions, I just want to share that we have some open positions for IS and MacOS engineers. So feel free to check out the opportunities we have and learn much more about our goals and our values and what they actually do in Grammarly. Thank you. Everyone, thank you for your more hands-on content. I would say. Uh, now let's answer some questions that we have. Uh, we have one question, but I think it would be nice to get more info. Like, question sounds like, and how many compile time you save using this approach? I hope you understand about this approach part. Yeah, uh, honestly, we didn't count on this approach because uh, it wasn't like a purpose to just save compile time, but more to save development time. Um, because you just you just don't write tests twice because you first you write them as Swift UI previews, but you don't use them as tests. But then you just duplicate that code a second time in your test bundle. So we kind of reduce the time for sure in the development. Unfortunately, we don't have oh maybe not unfortunately, but luckily we don't have time trackers to actually know how much time we reduced on that. Yeah, but uh, the, the fact that it's, it was done is for sure. Yeah. Thank you. And one more question. Like, did you face any issues with auto-generated snapshots, maybe after Xcode update or anything else? Yeah, the auto-generation step sounds pretty stable. So it, it just generates your uh, uh, runtime test. If you ever worked with Quick and Nimble, you may know about that a lot, because if you uh look at the implementation they don't have any test method inside so you just write some specs you don't create method called test you just you just start writing but suddenly when you run tests you can see that new test cases appear so it works absolutely the same uh, the problems that we faced were mostly related to macOS, and they were related to the fact that if you want to uh, generate snapshot from macOS, uh just like on ios you need a simulator but there's no simulator for macOS. And there's like much more work was done uh, configuring uh, uh, virtual display from macOS. And maybe sometime we'll talk or create a blog about that to, to share with you guys. Yeah. Thank you. And one more question. Why a framework by point three and not anything else? Yeah, well, like I mentioned, if if you just take a look or uh, if you remember what I've shown you about the dynamic test class, uh, it is, well, it is kind of possible, but it's kind of less likely that you can, you can properly configure that if you will use Facebook's, uh, uh, actually today Uber's frameworks, because uh, you have to use their base class and where you will receive the implementation of uh, snapshotting. Uh, in, well, in our case, we can create our own class can, or inherit from any other classes and use it however we want. Yeah, plus it has some more extra features related to testing. Um, which you can just manually compare on Git uh, based on what interface they provide. Yeah. Thank you, Roman. Thanks a lot for your answers. So the the official part is now over, and I thank you all of all of you for joining us.